Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined by the drum engraving master, John Aldridge. John, how are you? I'm just fine. How about yourself? Good. Good. This is really cool because uh, I've seen your work. I think everyone has seen your work for a long time. Um, basically, I think if you've seen an engraved drum, uh, you have seen John's work. So this is, this is really cool. <laughs> There's, there's a lot of them out there. There's there's a whole new crop of engravers that are coming up, too, that are pretty sharp. Really? Adrian Kersler just blows me away. He's a, he's an artist artist. Hmm. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's John Christensen, who's a jeweler who's just adapting his jewelry engraving techniques to drums now. And he's combining those techniques with wriggle engraving, which is what you typically see on vintage drum engraving. Yeah, and that's that's awesome. And I like how you're very openly like you want to teach people. You want this art to carry on and you're not very like proprietary about it. Like you you like the art spreading. When I tried to or started to learn how to engrave, no engraver would speak to me. They would they would not have a nice little five minute conversation with me and then they would just completely dismiss me as a total punter mm. who would never go anywhere. <laughs> Finally talked an old man into showing me his tools and what kind of movement it took to do it. And then I just kind of ruined everything for a long time. So I'd rather see somebody else just avoid the three years of running crap that I did. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, so why don't you tell people, like, let's say someone has no idea what we're even talking about, about drum engraving. Um, why don't you give a little bit of a, of a description of what drum engraving um, actually is and then you can at the same time where did drum engraving start when i think of it i think of black beauties um mm. maybe it's slingerland or this is an a and f drum that i did yesterday wow it's uh it just has a small decorative pattern that's reminiscent of a design that leedy and i believe slingerland maybe even ludwig all three used as a decorative pearl inlay design where you had three colors of sparkle and this is a metal drum, so there's no inlay, so I just engraved that pattern into it. So it's almost, um, I, I'll post a picture of it online, but it's almost like a Masonic um, kind of symbol with, you know, like the the, the pattern, which is kind of neat. And so you're working with a lot with A and F as well. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I work with just about anybody who dials me up on the phone. I'm not an exclusive guy. Engraving is such a narrow bandwidth occupation yeah. that there's not any company that would ever want to have a full-time engraver on because i mean i could engrave way more than they could sell and it would also drive the price of engraving down if there were people just furiously at it like there were in the 20s you know but uh this is the an example of the tool that i use hmm. yeah and so so explain because again people won't be able to see we're we're doing video but people folks who are listening won't be able to see so what is that tool it's a it's a it's called a graver. It's about a four inch long blade with a wooden handle that looks like a file handle on it. And you basically hold that with your finger on the tip of it, you know, to the direction you're gonna engrave. You bury one corner of it because it's a square headed engraver, and then you walk from tip to tip, stroking or cutting the metal out between tips. And you have different widths of blades to create different widths of strokes. Hmm. You can slide the blade sideways to get a really tight, curvy, wispy looking line. Or you can really dig in and slide the blade through the metal as you're going along to get a groove, like a trench thing. Now, I don't engrave like a traditional engraver who was taught how to do it right does it. When you look at Adrian Kersler's stuff, he is a traditional, uh, he did a, a pre apprenticeship, the whole thing, he's a legit deal. I'm the guy in the backyard scratching stuff because he couldn't afford to buy it. And uh, this technique that I have is all strictly based on me not knowing what to do yeah. and pushing and forcing until I figured out how to do it. And, you know, some of these things get me into a lot of trouble because, you know, I would scratch drums. And that's not a handy thing to do. <laughs> People don't like to get their drum back with an extra line on it. <laughs> But some of the most interesting patterns that I've ever gotten have evolved from fixing a scratch. Really? You know, I would go off the pattern, and it's like, oh, shit, that's way outside the line. So I've got to put something on it that will cover that. And then I've got to repeat it 16 or 20 times, mirror it, <laughs> so that it looks like it belongs there. Yeah. 
Man, that's kind of like playing jazz or something where it's like if you make a mistake, you better make that mistake again so it doesn't sound like it's a mistake. Yeah, yeah, you better repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's the thing about engraving. People look at it and they say, wow, that's so precise and such precision where every one of those patterns is so exactly different. <laughs> Not so. <They're, laughs> it's the repetition that fools your eye into thinking that they're all perfect and precision done. Every yeah. one of those flowers on every drum I've ever done, every one of those scrolls on every drum, there's something wrong with it. The hardest thing to cut is what I just showed you. That simple little straight line thing, oh boy, is that a bear. Mm. The simpler the pattern and the more it's just exposed to you, the harder it is to cut it because you, you just, any little boggle, any little jiggle or toddle shows up in the, in the thing and, and the longer you look at it, the more you see but, you know, most people look at a drum and their first reaction is they see the whole drum in its entirety and they're looking at all the patterns and, and that's just what they see. Yeah, you're you're not looking at that individual little thing. I'm sure you see things where you go, oh. I could show you all the mistakes in every drum I've ever done. Oh, man. You know, I used to rape myself on the engraving and put it in the engraving. If you've got a 90th anniversary Black Beauty from Ludwig hidden in my signature, or not my signature, it's actually in the the scroll work below the brand, there are, are little pie shaped lines from zero to four, four being a really, oh my God, I had a great day today. This looks really good. I didn't scratch anything. I didn't screw anything up. And then there's the days when it's, whew, I got through that one. Mm. You know, it's, it, the, the thing with drums is they're not every one of them is the same. Even though you get a stack of 30 shells from one company, all came from the same metal shop, all came from the same plating shop, everything was buffed by the same guy, but depending on how it was treated or not treated, you'll have some shells that have really, really hard spots. Mm. You can't see them from the surface, you can't predict when they're going to happen, but all of a sudden you're cutting along through the butter and the, the crushed glass section comes along. Mm. <laughs> you have to try to get through that and make it look the same as when you were cutting through the butter, and it's really difficult to do. The companies that I'm working with now are not uh, spinning things as much as they're either rolling it or hydroforming it. And uh, when you do those two processes, the metal is not um, it's not hammered into shape or or bent into shape. It's swoosh, swooshed into shape. <laughs> but uh, wow. and, you know, you just bend it into shape and you weld the, the joint. So there's not as much stress on that metal. I have a lot less problem with A and F drums and uh, joyful noise drums and and Ludwig drums nowadays. The early the seventies Ludwig Black Beauties were hard, hard, hard to engrave because they were not annealed. They were spun. The spinning marks were still inside the drum. The drum would retain those marks. And boy, when I saw one of those coming down the pike, I knew it was going to be a long day. But uh, yeah. yeah, that's cool. Well. Um... So as you're kind of telling us a little bit more of the technical stuff, I should mention also that you were the founder of Not So Modern Drummer, which yeah. is uh, like the the Bible for a lot of vintage drum people just to to be able to use as a resource. So obviously yeah. you have a huge knowledge of vintage drums, but um, I think yeah. everyone would be interested in knowing uh, when did drum engraving begin? You can you can kind of jump, you know, jump around if you want, if it's a if there's certain points where it stayed the same for a long time. But. Why don't you just take us through the history of drum engraving? Well, my awareness of drum engraving probably starts as in the late 1880s and, and companies like Duplex. And uh, I don't even know the other names of the companies right off the top of my head. But they were back in that day, you didn't have the lacquers and paints that we have that are just common usage things. We didn't have automotive finishes, which are predominant in drums today. We didn't have sparkle finishes. They didn't have anything but wood or metal. And really the only way to ornament a metal shell was to plate it or paint it. And uh, engraving was a really common art form, uh, uh, an industrial art form at the time. You could get just about anything engraved in the 1880s. It was very common. Every watch shop, which there were a lot of back then, every jeweler had an engraver on staff. And it wasn't hard to find an engraver. You know, wages were like not much above minimum wage. So, you know, it was a common art and, and it was very easy to get done. So just about every drum company that came along had some kind of engraving 
Stromberg Drum Company, Ludwig Drum Company, start when they started in 1909. Um, Sonor over in Europe was doing it as soon as they started. Um, all of these drum companies were basically just copying from other industries, and the one major industry I can think of is it's the gun industry. And the gun industry uses a different point and very little wriggling on, on guns because uh, the metal is so hard that you have to use a hammer with the tool. Same tool I use, but instead of pushing it with my hand and wiggling it, they're tapping along with a hammer and pushing the blade through the metal in tiny little strokes. But the style of engraving that we recognize right now is this is what engraving is to the drum industry is, is almost 90%, 95% wriggle engraving, which is exactly what I do. The only reason I learned how to engrave was to do drums. So I really wasn't driven to learn how to do push engraving or hammer engraving or chisel engraving or, or uh, there's lots of different ways you can do this. But this is what everybody recognizes when you say engraving. Ludwig probably was my motivation for learning to engrave. I had seen, you know, some Ludwig Black Beauties. But as soon as I found the Ludwig Black Beauty, I realized there was also a Lady Black Elite, uh, a Slingerland Black Beauty. The Ludwig, by the way, was called a Deluxe in the beginning. It wasn't a Black Beauty until after Slingerland used the name in a catalog. And Ludwig, two years later, put it in their catalog as a Black Beauty. And since it was not uh, really a licensed term, there was never a problem with that. And, and everybody kind of ref refers to a drum finished in black with engraving on it as a black beauty, regardless of who made it. But every, every drum company had their version of that. And until pearl coverings came out in the late 20s or mid 20s and became popular and Pirelin and sparkle finishes came into the mix, you just didn't have anything black or white or red paint. Uh, and so when those other finishes came out and all of a sudden drummers had a lot more options at the same time that drum sets kind of came into being, it, it kind of pushed the engraving thing out of the market. The other thing about engraving on drums is when that market started, a drummer only had a snare drum and a bass drum. That was your drum set. And you might have a Chinese tom, which was just a little bitty thing with tacked heads that went thoop and didn't really make a tom noise, but it was a sound effect. And that's, that, besides those two drums, that's what the drum set was, was a, a group of sound effects to accompany something else or play with a band and make it cheaper than hiring a snare drummer and a bass drummer. So, uh, but you know, as, in, as the drum set grew and you had to buy more pieces, well, all of a sudden you didn't have as much to spend on your snare drum. And since the snare drums that were matching your drum set were cheaper, well, hey, why not get a matching snare drum? And so engraving, by the mid-30s and the Depression, engraving had pretty largely died out. It's, you'll still find uh, engraved drums into the 37, 38, but they're really rare just because people couldn't afford them. The Depression was hard on everybody, uh, and they just completely disappeared with World War II. And until Gretsch did that one in 67 to, to 71, that was the only hand engraved drum that came along. Ludwig revived the Black Beauty in 76 with laser engraving. You know, every pattern was exactly the same on those, except for it was a variable depth because the lasers were so crude, you couldn't get the exact same flower every time, which is, it's odd. You know, you get this laser to be precise and it wasn't developed enough to be precise. Yeah. But uh, I started engraving for Ludwig, well, I started engraving in 83, and uh, in 89, I guess it was, Ludwig called, and Harry Kangany, he used to have a really big drum shop in Indianapolis called Drum Center of Indianapolis. He was a really good friend, and I had done a drum for him to give to Kenny Aronoff, and then his employees called and had me do a drum for him, which uh, he sent him a picture of, or he sent him the drum, one of those drums he sent to Ludwig, and says, you should do this. And because he was one of Ludwig's biggest dealers at the time, they listened to it. And they sent me three drums to engrave, and that's how I got into working with them. Wow. Now, how long would it take you to do, let's say someone gives you a Black Beauty, what's the process um, look like? And does every drum that comes out of Ludwig that's engraved go through your hands, or do they still use any of the laser process for like mass production? Not on the Black Beauty. The lasers uh, and... 
you know, I, while I've done all the Black Beauties, they also use Adrian Kersler for things, too, uh, but not the Black Beauty. Uh, we were supposed to do a 110th anniversary. We were in talks to do that, and then the guy that was their product manager, Terry Bissett, was hired away from Ludwig by Steve Maxwell to run Fork's Drum Closet and his other two shops in New York and Chicago. So that the 110th just disappeared in a heartbeat, and which is a shame because they finally produced an eight lug drum, which is what I love. Mm -hmm. Despite Ludwig not producing a, a limited edition like that, I've had a slew of them come through here from individuals and shops that want them engraved. Mm. So now, what is that? What is that process though? Like the length and what does it look like for you if I if someone sends you a say, drum? You called me today and you said I need I would like to have a drum engraved and I know what pattern it is. If you know what pattern it is, and I have that pattern, I've cut that pattern, I can give you an exact price on it. It's There's a lot of really standardized patterns that are, you know, 375 to 425, you know, things like that. The Most of the, the vintage original patterns from Ludwig and Leedy and stuff, you know, the Leedy Thunderbird, 275. Wow, that's fair. 5 to 14. Uh, it, but that's a real simple geometric pattern, lots of straight lines. Uh but like a Ludwig flower pattern, like you'd see on the 1990 limited edition, that's 375 on a 5 by 14, 395 on a 6.5 by 14. Hmm. If you called me and said, I want a flower pattern on my drum, I said, great, strip the hardware off, put the shell in a box, send me the shell, and you'll be such and such number in line when it gets here. And I try not to tell people to ship stuff until I know that by the time it gets here, it'll leave here within a week or maybe a week and a half. It if I'm lucky. Now, uh, a lot of times things arrive without me knowing they're going to arrive, and they just kind of go to the end of the line, and a lot of times I plan my engraving time around when I'm going to be on the road. You know, when I'm at home, I'll engrave. When I'm not, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Sometimes a month that your drum will sit here while I'm on the road doing something, and I'll only come back for a week. And at that, in that time, I'll try to get to your, you know, whatever drums are there. But typically, if I've told you to send me a drum this week, it'll go out by Friday. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, the fact that you can sit there and just have the focus and uh, and get it done. Now, are you like, I, I would just be curious, do you do like pencil to paper, paintbrush to canvas artwork as well? Or are you just an engraver? I'm just an engraver, and I'm a pretty lousy artist. Uh, <laughs> I, I draw things. I draw my, my basic shapes. And then I scan them into my computer, and I use a, a vector drawing program to create lines that are perfectly smooth. And, you know, it'll take me a couple of hours to get a nice scroll pattern drawn up to the point where I can then replicate it, flip it, mirror it, print it on a grid that has dots on it for the lug holes in the drum that I'm going to put that pattern on. All the standard patterns, they're in the computer. It's kind of like, um, like a tattoo where they kind of lay out a... Um you know, a stencil of it, and then you follow it. And yeah, people ask me, do you, do you do tattoos? And I said, yeah, but it gets real bloody, and you got to bring your own tarp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you have to sign something beforehand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, as you said before, the history of drum engraving isn't, I mean, it's it's fascinating, but it's not a super long one. Like, I guess people have just been doing it, and it has that kind of, um, like, everything in that late 1800s, early 1900s just seemed very ornate. But, like, when you hit World War II, that didn't become a priority. I, I find yeah. the rolling bombers and all that stuff very fascinating where things changed. Yeah, things changed dramatically just as a result of the of the the situation, you know. And it as we've evolved as a society and, and uh, technology has come up to us, you know, we've gone through all kinds of things. The drum set during its infancy went through, you know, just being a bass drum and a snare drum. And then streetcars came along, and all of a sudden you had to carry your bass drum and snare drum onto a streetcar. Well, you could only get on with what you could carry in one trip. So they invented ways to put everything inside the bass drum or make a bass drum that would fold up or something that would allow you to walk down the street with a drum set in your hands. And that cycle of making a drum set that you can carry in has repeated a couple of times throughout history, as you probably have noticed it. Um, the hip gig and the Sonor Jungle Kits, all of those little bitty tiny drum sets that you can carry. They're caused by the necessities of things around us, like you're playing in coffee shops, which are smaller venues that didn't exist, you know, a long time ago, or they did, but now we've got them again, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> yeah, I have a few episodes on like the uh, like the trap drummers and the silent movie era and things like mm -hmm. that, and it's just... Uh, I love those. 
because I've watched a bunch of your stuff. Oh, great. <laughs> awesome. Now, one thing that I think people would be interested in as well is Not So Modern Drummer. And for folks who don't know what that is, it's basically a magazine, uh, or it was a magazine. It's still online, but um, based around vintage drums and was just, again, beloved by people um, in that community. So you want to talk a little bit about that? Like what made you start that and, and all that good stuff? Sure, sure. I, I was doing a little bit of writing for Modern Drummer back in the late 80s. And uh, mostly it was just little short articles on Black Beauties and Radio Kings and things like that. And it was just getting started as a writer. But I was really getting under the under, underway as a drum collector. It, it just hit me like the rabies. I had to have them. I had to have them now. I spent three, four hundred bucks a month on a phone bill back when long distance was the only way you could speak to someone in the, in the moment. Wow. I still have notebooks full of original mail, handwritten correspondence between me and people I was doing drums with. You know, had swaps going back in the morning. You know, you write a letter. I think I'd I'd give you three twenty five for this drum, and you wait for a week to get the response. Well, I was really thinking more three seventy five. You know, but it just took a while to get it done. But you know, there were I had this one friend Jim Pettit who's a has. Jim Pettit's drum shop there in Memphis. And we used to have two or three drums between us, flying between us. There was no money exchange. We were just trading. Hmm. And, you know, we were trading black beauties. <laughs> and it was, you know, there was a thing about black beauties. You couldn't get one until you had one. You know, there was a certain number of people that had them, and they weren't letting go of them. But there was a lot of swapping between those people. Well, anyway, Not So Modern Drummer came about because when I first got involved with it, there were only about eight people that I had any clue of that knew about it. By the time I started Not So Modern Drummer, I was trying to put together a mailing list. So I figured, if I know eight guys, these eight guys have to know a bunch of other people. So I sent out a letter to these eight guys. I says, hey, let's quit playing Cloak and Dagger. Let's figure out who's doing this stuff so we can all communicate and we can all find stuff. I says, if you'll send me the names and addresses and phone numbers of people you know that are interested in vintage drums, I'll compile a mailing list and send it out to all of our group, to our 32 people, which is what it had grown to by the time it got out. And uh, that started a little directory. And to when I printed the directory, I said, you know, I've just written this article for Modern Drummer. If some, some of you guys who are into Black Beauties would take a look at it and help me proof it and stop me from making any ridiculous mistakes, please do. And so I put that in there with the mailing list. And the response that I got back from that says, oh, you should do this every month, John. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, had a, I was a music teacher at an elementary school, uh, teaching kindergarten through third grade at the time that I started it. And most of them were printed on the Xerox machine at the school. For free. <laughs> For free. They knew about it. I'm, I wasn't stealing. They knew about it and they supported me on it. But uh, it grew pretty rapidly. By the end of the first year, we had probably, well, you can just go back and look at the first year directory and count them. Hmm. Because every year for the first five or six years, I put out a directory at the end of the year. And everyone who joined went into the directory, unless you elected not to be in it. Some people just really did not want to be contacted, but they wanted the information. And since the internet really wasn't out there yet, we were the information. It was really the only place you could find it, gathered together and printed out in one spot. And since I was sending it out anyway, and we were busy doing this other stuff anyway, how about we put a for sale or trade thing in there so we can swap between each other? And if you, I'm not going to do this for nothing, but for eight bucks a year, uh, you can put six lines of ads in each issue if, with your subscription. So it was basically the first bulletin board for drummers to, to swap vintage gear on and occasionally find something new about it. And as it evolved along, you know, we added the, the wanted for sale, then the restoration tips, people reproducing things. Other people started to send me articles, so I didn't have to write the whole damn thing myself. Uh, Chet Falzerano, Rob Cook, um, gosh, some of these guys are dead now, uh, but Greg Wilson, it was like the, the early Black Beauty King. I mean, he's, I remember he used to have print, printed postcards that had five of his favorite Black Beauties from the 20s. Hmm. And you know, I remember he tried to swap me a set of K-Zildjian hi-hats for my Black Beauty one time. <laughs> ah, 
I was born yesterday, but <laughs> That's awesome. Did did Modern Drummer have anything to say? Because the name obviously is like a play yeah. on. Did they say anything about it? By the time they noticed it, which was two years after I'd run it, I'd already copyrighted and trademarked the name. And since I was in a business arrangement with them, they called and they said, we have a problem with you using that name. And I said, well, I wish you'd called me a couple of years ago when I started using it. And they said, well, we didn't know about it. I said, I've been writing for you for, for <laughs> all this time, and you didn't notice it. So they finally said, well, what's, what's your goal? And I said, well, my goal is to not be you and to not do what you're doing and to present the other side of it that you seem to not want to show in your magazine because I was I really it was out of frustration with them not publishing as fast as my little impatient mind wanted to get the information out there and to soak up the information from other people. And they had a couple of other guys writing vintage articles, a guy named Cheech Yero. Uh, I mean, he wrote great stuff, but they just, it was like once a quarter, they'd put something in there for vintage drums. And uh, so it, it was just me being impatient. Got That's it. pretty much the reason why it, it happened. Uh, it mm. turned into a magazine. And from that point on, it, crawfished and crawfished and crawfished its way into being a printed publication that was semi-respectable yeah no i mean it's yeah. it's got a strong part in history and, and i want to say too that i like modern drummer <laughs> and then yeah. th that's also I, modern I read modern drummer and still do but it was you know at the time i was just sick of modern drums and wanted i wanted some radio kings and a black beauty <laughs> well, it's it's funny because I find myself in right now kind of being the drum history guy of like when people are zigging, you zagged and everyone's going modern. And then and you realize there's tons of these people out here, like obviously yeah, people that wanted it too. Yeah. Yeah. And I learned from every one of those people. The reason my phone bill was so outrageous was because every time I didn't know something, I would call somebody that I thought did. And they might say, well, I don't know, but this guy knows. So dang the phone thing would start my wife and i it got so bad that we went into marriage counseling over my abuse of the phone talking vintage drums wow you you really took one for the team well it sounds funny now but you know, i'd started the newsletter or i'd started trying to get this thing and in this counseling session she says well why don't you just start a newsletter for you and your little drum geek buddies and i says wow that's that's a good idea yeah i will and it it saved your it saved your marriage. Yeah, but uh, it but that at the peak of it, m once I went to offset printing and and uh, distribution, this was at the very 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 tail end of the boom in print publications. Mm -hmm. And I was in Barnes and Noble, B Dalton, Walden Books, Bookstop, Bookstar, Borders, Tower Records, every damn one of those places that distributed stuff. I was distributed by Ingram Periodicals, which is the biggest periodicals distributor in the South, I believe, and they may even be in the United States, but it went to 22 different countries. I had 15, 1600 subscribers. When the internet really hit, that's what I had. Wow. But I was printing 20,000 copies. At the school? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. I, I went from the school to uh, buying a high output Xerox machine in my house. Wow. To, uh, sending it off for to have films made to making the films myself hmm. you know i worked as a press assistant when i was a kid on a newspaper so i learned the really 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 old way and then while i was working on the old press they brought in a new offset press i was working on a lead type press where you would use hot lead to melt it into a cylinder that would print the page wow it was crazy but you know watching it go from that to offset press where you have negatives and plates that are printed photographically uh, to what it is now digitally. I mean, I rode that horse all the way through. Hmm. So, well, you uh, sold it to Bill Ludwig the third. Yep. Yep. He, uh, he was, you know, I love Bill to death, but he's not a great businessman. Bill's a great drum guy. His enthusiasm for drums and his desire to carry on the family's legacy is great. But, you know, I'm a horrible businessman. And Bill just wasn't much better than me. Uh, so he was able to keep it going for about three years. But, I mean, the thing that I was facing, the Internet, didn't slow down when I sold it. So he was he was faced with, you know, well, how to do that. And I don't think he knew how to turn it into a digital publication. And when he got ready to sell it, George Lawrence was interested in, in doing that. So that's how he bought into it.
But uh, I ran it for, for Bill for about a year after he bought it, and I ran it for George for a couple of months after he bought it, hmm. just kind of help him get it started. But uh, I think George made the right call switching it to an online publication. There's no place in the world for a small publication to print things. It just is so expensive to produce it and send it out that, you know, it's the cost of the thing is half the cost of, of producing it. So there's no profit in it, really. The only way to make any money is to reduce those production costs by going online. Yeah. And it's really clear that it's not about the money, but no, you physically we're just not getting rich no matter what you think. <laughs> no, but you can't lose money. That's when uh... my kids called it. Not so many dollars. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I bet. And I talked to, I remember on the episode I did with uh, Joe Luoma about Camco, he talked about doing these phone calls back and forth. And is it in good shape or is it mint shape? Is it perfect? Is What's wrong with it? And it's like, I didn't grow up with that. So I, I my as a kid, I would get the trade and post at like a local gas station and look through it for drums. And um, mm-hmm. that's different even than having to call people on the phone. And, and uh, but you're, you're yeah. I mean, really, it's ahead of its time. And you were kind of a pioneer with that. So that's. You should be proud. I thought computers were really cool at the time. And my wife had, had just started working on her master's. So we bought her an IBM 8088 machine, which had the newest thing in the market, an amber monitor. Mm. No internet still. Yeah. The only way to get a file into your computer was to take a disk from one computer to another computer and put it in that computer. But the first time that I produced Not So Modern Drummer, it was done on a typewriter. Oh, wow. And then I cut the pieces out that I had typed, glued them onto another sheet, and Xeroxed it. <laughs> That's awesome. That's number one, right? Yeah, yeah, it's still out there. But the cover was done on an Apple IIe, and it was it was in color when I printed it. But I could, they didn't have color Xeroxes then, so I can only Xerox oh, it. Oh man, That's Our awesome. Issues. Uh, Bill Cardwell, who owns CNC Drum Shop, he worked for Bayer Aspirin at the time. And he conned them into letting us use their color copier to produce 300 copies of the first color centerfold. <laughs> Man, you're just jumping around from copier to copier. <laughs> yeah, copier to copier. Who's who's got? I mean, to print a single page of color in 1980, well, 92 or 93, the the separations would cost you 800 dollars. That means to turn it from a color picture of a page into four pieces of film that would print color, oh. that process cost you $800. And, you know, I couldn't afford that, not for each magazine. I wasn't making any money on it. But uh, it went from that to, well, I can push a button in Cork Express, and it will produce those separations for nothing digitally. Then all I have to do is print the films. So it went from being $800 to do this to pushing a button and paying someone 25 cents a sheet to output it onto film. So, I mean, it went from the sublime to the ridiculous. Yeah. And technology changes so fast that it's just, I mean, it's hard to keep up with it. And as you said, with it being now, I love getting it as like a, a newsletter in the email and you click on it and you go into it and then you can expand and look at the, the articles and, uh, it but it's so deeper than you could ever do with a magazine. Yeah. You know? But, uh, there's just something about holding a piece of paper in your hands that I kind of like. Yeah, it's like having a record versus a digit, something on Spotify, you know. Exactly, exactly. Do you have any memories of like, this was my favorite article I wrote, or even just vintage drums in, in, in general? Like, do you have any little fun, like, facts or historical tidbits that you think everyone would find interesting that your your regular listener might not uh, might not know? I mean, I, I don't really, I don't really consider myself to be a great writer. Uh, <laughs> so I was, I was just trying to get information out. Got it. I mean, Here's how bad it was. I knew so little about typesetting and design that when I finally did get the ability to put things on a computer and lay it out together on my first Macintosh, it went edge to edge on the sheet. There was maybe an eighth of an inch border. The text was as small as I could make it to get as much information as I could put on it. Yeah. And those early issues are almost illegible because they're – how much crap can I, if I shrink it 30%, I can get this 10 point type, you That's know, hysterical. Just, just jam crap. it on. <laughs> and you know, it was more limited by how much paper can I afford to buy to take to the school to print with than 
what should it look like? I was not concerned at all with what Not So Modern Drummer looked like for the longest, long time. It was just about, let's get some information out there. And it wasn't until I started selling advertisements in it. For the longest time, I would not sell an ad. Hmm. <laughs> I just, I was violently opposed to commercializing my hobby, mainly because it would make the drums that I wanted be too expensive for me to buy. Yeah. Who was your <laughs> first uh, advertiser? Liam Mulholland with A Drummer's Tradition. Okay. And he's the one that convinced me to do it. Wow. A full, first off, he started with a half-page ad, and then he bought a full-page ad. And that shop's still in business. Liam passed away several years ago. But he was the first guy to convince me that magazines really exist to sell ads. And if you ever hope to pay for this thing, you're going to have to sell ads. Hmm. Because the subscribership won't even pay for the postage, my friend. <laughs> Man, it's funny, John, because like we are, uh, I have had the the debate with myself of I want to keep the podcast pure and I don't want to, because podcasts, they typically have advertising at the beginning and I've been like, I don't want to have ads. I don't want it to seem like I'm selling out if I have, let's say Ludwig on an episode about Gretsch. But uh, boy, I tell you, when you have a kid and you got to pay the bills, you start to think like, you know what? Advertising could be pretty good. Advertising could be pretty slick, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, uh. It made the difference eventually between me just ambling along as a black and white Xerox publication, which I had a friend who stuck to that gun, and his name was Dave Seville. He had a, comp uh, a thing very – he started about the same time I did called the Old Drummers Club in England, and it was like a four- to six-page, 11 by – eight and a half by 11 folded in half, so it was a little booklet, Xerox, black and white. Same exact thing I was doing, vintage articles on European vintage drums and art and wanted ads from people over there and for sale. Their laws didn't allow them to buy and sell that way, but they could inform people that they had things. Oh, so, wow. but it was, uh, he stuck to his guns. I think he may still even be producing it. Hmm. I'll have to get but in touch I, with him. Yeah. His name is Dave Seville, hmm. S-E-V-I-L-L-E. But, uh. There's a lot of guys over in England that, you know, got into American drums, and, and as a as a consequence, they talked to me, and I got into European drums a little bit. Uh, I never did get into collecting those. I was just too deep into Black Beauties and Radio Kings. But uh, it, when, I, when I first started collecting, you could go into a pawn shop, and you could buy a Superphonic for $35, mm. a, a transition badge, Superphonic brass, that now goes for $750 to $1250. Wow. And then within 10 years, you go in and you ask the pawn shop guys, hey, you got any drums back there? And they go, what are you looking for, Black Beauties or Radio Kings? <laughs> I knew I was in trouble when I started going into pawn shops and they'd pull out my book or pull out the magazine. I said, where'd you get that? <laughs> That's hysterical. Yeah, I go into pawn shops all the time. And uh, I've found that like usually in antique shops, I'll have better luck than a pawn shop because pawn mm -hmm. shops have the Internet now. Obviously, mm -hmm. they can look up everything, and it's like, I'm looking for the, the goodwill find. When you go into a pawn shop, if you're going to sell something to them, the first thing they'll do is look it up on the internet and get a comparable value. Yeah. You know, so yeah, yeah. nothing to be saved there. The internet was the great leveler. Mm -hmm. You know, all of a sudden, there was no hidden market. Everybody could get to everything, and it's just, it's created a lot of confusion because once people see something in print, we're conditioned to believe that it's true. And there's a lot of people that kind of go off half cocked. They will have read something that I wrote a hundred years ago mm -hmm. that's wrong. And they never bothered to see the, the correction. They just read that one thing. And after I learned that it was wrong, I, I corrected it, you know. But still, there's a lot of mistakes out there, you know. It took me a long time to, to figure out, don't print it unless you got the proof in front of you, you know. I was just printing based on anecdotal information at first. It was just, you know, well, Bill said, well, you know, Don over here says he had one of these, you know, that kind of stuff. Man, we have a lot of parallels because there's things with early episodes I've done where I'm like, yeah, sure. You know, we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about this. And then I, someone, a lot, when people come out of the woodwork and say, hey, that wasn't right. That wasn't right. You missed this, this, and this. And I, and I'm grateful for guys like Mark Cooper, Rob Cook. Brooks Tegler will tell me like, Hey, you missed this, this, and this. I don't even act like I know anything about radio Kings around Brooks. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I just quietly learn from him, but, um, I like our community cause it's typically for the most part, very nice and say, Hey, I really love this, but 
you missed this and this and let's try and fix it and stuff. That was the story of my life for a long time in the, in the early part of not so modern. Era. Hey man, this is wrong. There'll be a, a review of my book where they've even found it. I don't know, but they'll, they'll, this book is ridiculous. All of this information is available on the internet. Why would you even buy this book? <laughs> well, let's see. Did you look at the publication date on that yeah. book? Yeah. Internet. There weren't no fancy internet when that was published. No, you were the internet. Why, why don't you tell people? So your book is Guide to Vintage Drums. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that a little bit as we wrap up here, and because um, it is seen also like not so modern drummer as just like a you know a handbook for people to follow and, and learn from, uh, even though stuff's on the internet. <laughs> well, like like everything else that you publish, as soon as you publish it, it's obsolete, and history has proven that with just about anybody who's written anything that's happened in their own time. You know, other other information comes to light after it's written. And that's the number one thing I have to warn people about my book. There's a lot more information about there. And if you want to get a picture of collecting when it started, that's pretty much what people were thinking back then. In 92, I, I took a lot of articles that I'd written for Not So Modern Drummer, and a couple of other people gave me their articles and allowed me to, to use them in there as well. Chet Falzerano let me use his history of the hi-hat. Uh, Rob Cook helped a little bit with it and uh, a couple of other guys, you know, finishing tips. And one guy wrote a little blurb about making an adapter plate for when you get a snare drum that you don't want to drill holes in, but you want to put a snare strainer on it that'll work. So, you know, that's once I had enough stuff, I really hadn't even considered doing a book, but Ron Middlebrook, who was the publisher of center stream publications uh, was going to do the Ludwig book by, uh, Paul Schmidt, mm -hmm. and he had been talking to Rob Cook, and Rob knew that I had just taken a whole bunch of really nice studio portraits of my collection, you know, just a few drums in my collection, and uh, he, he told him that I had these pictures, and he called and asked if I he could borrow one of those pictures or use it on the cover of the book. So the, the drum that's on the cover of Paul Schmidt's book was My Black Beauty. Uh, it's a 1923 then I found it new old stock. It had fallen over on the top shelf of a music store and lain there since the twenties and was really? discovered. Yeah. <laughs> and a friend, a friend of mine was on tour with Eddie money and he saw this drum in the shop and he tried to buy it. And the guy said, no, it's not for sale, but I've got this other one over here. And he, it was another black beauty, a five to 14, but it was worn totally out. I mean, the, Tension rods had worn down through the collar hooks to the point where they were sitting on the hoop. Mm. So, but I wound up buying that drum. I didn't buy it from him. I swapped him a Gretsch drum that I got for 35 bucks at a pawn shop for that drum. Then uh, I, I says, well, where's this shop that had this drum that's pristine that's not for sale? And he goes, well, I'm not going to tell you. You'd go buy it. I said, well, it's not for sale. He, he says, at least tell me the name of the city where it was. And he says, it's A. Hey, so I looked up his his uh, tour itinerary, and they just played in Akron, Ohio. I said, Akron, Ohio. There's only one guy in Akron, Ohio that could possibly have that, and that would be Tom Humphreys. And it was Tom Humphreys. Tom owned a place called Ace Music. He had worked at the store as a kid, and that's when they found that drum, and it had been in that store all those years. Well, when the old man that owned it sold it, he sold it to Tom. And that drum was on display in the shop. And uh, when Glenn Simmons came through there, he's the one that told me about it. Well, I called Tom and I says, I hear you've got a black beauty in there that's not for sale. He says, yep, it's an awful pretty one, too. And it was it was just, it had fallen over under a heating vent, and apparently the top head cracked. It was calfskin head, but there were no stick marks anywhere on it. Mm. Still a factory head. I wound up talking him into selling it to me. And uh, it, that drum wound up bailing me out of a really, really serious situation. When my son was born, he, uh, he, it was complications. Let's just say I grew $60,000 in debt in one day. Okay. Well, my friend Hiroshiga from Japan, he's a drum tech drummer over there, called me up and he says, John, somebody's trying to sell me the drum off the cover of the Ludwig book. And I said, well, they shouldn't be trying to do that because I'm sitting here looking at it. It's in my office. And he says, well, I want to buy that drum. And and, and I had already told him the story of how I got it, right? So I said, well, it's not for sale. He goes, well, what if I offer you stupid money? <laughs> says, Ooh, stupid money talks. What are you thinking? And he shot me a price that was so ridiculous, I just couldn't say no. And especially in light of the fact that I had 
just incurred this huge debt. So it enabled me to get an immediate handle on paying that back. Bought it for five hundred and sold it for ten thousand. Oh, that's like yeah. one of the best drum hunting stories I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> that poor hero, hero, the the yen was sailing high then when he bought it. I mean, he was like his yen was twice the value of the dollar. So to him, it was, it was like paying half the price. And then the yen went in the toilet. And so 20 years later, he called me back and says, you want to buy this back? I says, man, I could never afford to buy it back. He goes, it won't cost you as much as I paid you. And I said, I still can't afford it. Yeah. So he sold it to somebody else. And uh, I believe Mike Carrado has it now. Of course. Yeah. That's... Of course. It's a good place for it. Yeah. So as we finish here, what's in your collection right now? I have very few drums that are really old or collectible because as a result of that $60,000 thing, I pretty much sold anything that was mint or clean or really pristine that somebody would really want to pay a lot of money for. When you know, I, I, I have one black beauty, which I purchased in 1990 or no 89. And it's a four by 14, eight lug black beauty of all the 200 or so that passed through my hands in that 20 years that I was really collecting hard, um, that was the best sounding one that I had. And I found there's a lot of, lot of variations in sound. Anything that was made during that time period, you got a lot of variations. The, the rolling was done, you know, by hand, everything was done by hand and it, it wasn't the precision manufacturing that we have today. So you'll get black beauties that sound like, Oh, this is the second coming of Jesus. And then you'll get some that sound, wow, this isn't worth pulling out of the case. Mm. Usually the ones that are worn out sound great. The ones that look pristine, there's a reason for it. But I have that, and I have a set of Radio Kings, which is basically every size from 6-inch to 20-inch in white marine pearl, none from the same set. I bought them all one at a time. Some of them I bought that size four or five times till I got one that sounded really good. I bought this set purely for the sound that they get. Same thing with Black Beauties. Radio Kings, toms, and bass drums, especially, very widely in their consistency. And good drums, bad drums, abused drums, taking care of drums. I, I weeded through it, and I had the luxury of doing that at the time because they were cheap. I mean, you could buy a, a 13-inch Radio King floor tom for 100 to 150 dollars, and a bass drum 150, 200 dollars. But I went through five 13 inch drums to get one really rocking 13 and, uh, the 14s i just had to go through two i have gene krupa's 20 inch floor top wow <laughs> oh that's that, amazing i got that from barrett deems he passed away we'd been talking about it he came to my booth at the chicago show in the late 90s and we were sitting there talking about it and he said i got this drum in my living room that gene gave me i use it for a lamp stand <laughs> and when he passed the, the the guy that was hired to get rid of his drums brought it to the Chicago show. And I was sitting there looking across the aisle at that drum, and I said, man, that's got to be that drum. And it had the tobacco stains on it for him spitting hair from his dog and his cat still on it. At the start of the day, he was asking 500 for it. And nobody wanted it at 500. Nobody wanted it at 400. Nobody wanted it at 300. Finally, at the end of the day, he says, come out to my car. And the drum was sitting on the ground behind his car. And he says, look in my car and see if there's a way for me to get this drum in the car. <laughs> hey, yeah, that drum ain't going in that car. Goes, 200. And I says, okay, I'll take it. $200. You know, for Gene Krupa's five, floor tom? I can't believe Gene that. Gene Krupa's floor tom. Given to Barrett Deems by Gene Krupa. Oh, I feel like yeah. Brooks would be all over that. <laughs> oh, yeah, nobody's ever going to be all over that. I've got a kid that knows what it is. And he's a drummer, too. Oh, so yeah. That, Go straight to him when I'm gone. You know, he's I, that's the great thing about having a collection and a kid who's a drummer that's interested in it because you don't have to get rid of it when you get old because you could just give it to the kid. Yeah. Now, is this your son who had the complications who you sold the drums? Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm glad I'll he's okay and he's a drummer. And... and now he just finished his first tour with a band out of Nashville and he's about to go to Europe with that same band. Hmm. So it's great. You know, I'm on the road and I'm fixing to load into a venue somewhere. And there's my son calling from the road. He's fixing to load into a venue somewhere. It's like, this, yeah, that's what it's all about. Stuff. Yeah, that's Watching awesome. Just be successful. My other son is a computer guru in in Silicon Valley. He makes all of us look stupid. <laughs> I was gonna say that's pretty cool too. 
Yeah. Anything else? No, John, I just want to, uh, I want to thank you for being on the show. Um, where can people find you if they want to like check out your stuff? So just Google John Aldridge or do you have a website for them? If you do a Google image search for John Aldridge engraved drums, you'll find a, a ton. Um, and then if you go to my Facebook page, there's photos in the photo galleries that you can look through. They're all public. You can see a lot of the projects I've done. There's some folders that have just one drum in them, some that have, you know, 100 drums in them. But then recently I've been doing more on Instagram. My ID on Instagram is Drum Scratcher. Uh, my ID on Facebook is just John Aldridge. Those are the two best ways to reach me because everybody's got those two ways. I would suggest messaging me either at drumscratcher at gmail.com or through the Facebook website. Perfect. Yeah. Man, I didn't realize how affordable, really, it is for you to, to knock out a drum for someone because I, I would have thought it would have been like 2000 bucks to get a snare engraved. Well, if you, you can get it up there if you really want to, <laughs> but most most people don't. You know, I, I'd say the, the number of $1,500 and up jobs that I've done in the last... 20 years is probably, I could count them on both hands. Yeah. Like a drum set. If you see one of the drum sets I've done, those are like month long projects. Oh yeah. For that, you're going to have a lot of money, but you know, for the most part, I didn't get into drum engraving to become a drum engraver or to make money. I got into drum engraving because I was a teacher and I had no money. And so the only way I was going to get it was to do it myself or find a way to get it done and, and I tried to find a way but couldn't afford it Man. so learning was the only way well you've done it awesome John well uh, I appreciate you being on the show and um, hopefully I'll see you around maybe I'll see you at the Chicago show coming up um, in May well you're in you're in where now Cincinnati did Cincinnati you we play in Cincinnati quite often really if you see REO coming through this year give me a yell I will and, Come over and we can. I can give you the nickel tour. <laughs> I'd love to. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned it, but John is on the road with REO Speedwagon. Um, it's the drum tech. It's my 15th year with them. So wow. I've been there half as long as the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Well, you're a good guy, John, and I appreciate you being on the show, and uh, I'll see you around. And um, again, thanks for being on, and we'll talk to you later. Well, thank you for being interested. I appreciate it. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast.